of you respected dr kasturi rangan chief guest for today's function and the main speaker our beloved chancellor dr b n suresh my colleagues and all participants it gives me immense pleasure to welcome all of you on 14th foundation day this particular event is in the memory of our first chancellor who had great love for this institute who introduced many new concepts including the iist at schools and on saturday we had a program for school students also parallelly in the morning and afternoon we are meeting the industry for charting out a future for iist and industry road map for collaboration in 13 years iist is on a upward trajectory and has many achievements 950 of our students after passing btech joined this row we have very large number of publications awards six granted patents more than 12 files patents filed which are being processed but today's event the apj kalam lecture we started in 2008 dr v k saraswat delivered the first lecture the topic was new frontiers in engineering on april 14 2008 the second lecture was given by professor mustansin barma on random questions in science third lecture was by professor anil sahar subude chairman aict on technical education a road map and vision for the future the fourth lecture was by professor v ramagopal rao director iit delhi on connecting academic r&d with product innovation the fifth lecture was by wing commander rakesh sharma which was titled making of a professional today's lecture would be immensely beneficial to all of us and it will really be a memorable event in the history of the iist so first i would like to introduce the speaker with a very very short biography to all people who have been in isro dr kasturi rangan does not require any introduction but for students and other participants uh, it is important that i introduce dr rangan dr krishna swami kasturi rangan completed his bachelor of science with honors and master of science in physics from bombay university and he received his doctorate in experimental high energy astronomy in 1971 while working at the physical research laboratory amdavad his interests include astrophysics space science technology and science related policies dr kasturi rangan was with indian space research organization for over a period of 35 years including 10 years as its chairman from 1994 to 2003 subsequently he was a member upper house of indian parliament rajya sabha from 2003 to 2009 and concurrently the director of national institute of advanced studies bangalore later on he served as a member of the erstwhile planning commission from 2009 to 2014 dr kasturi rangan was entrusted with the task of heading the karnataka knowledge commission 2008 to 2012 and 2013 to 2019 between july 2017 to december 2018 he was the chairman of the committee entrusted with drafting the new education policy a topic which he will speak today dr kasturi rangan presently is the chairman of the governing board of inter university center for astronomy and astrophysics abbreviated as iuka pune he is chancellor of the central university of rajasthan he is chairperson of niit university nimrana he is president of the current science association bangalore 
He is chairman of the board of governors of Vikram Sarabhai Community Science Center, Ahmedabad. He is member of the Atomic Energy Commission, emeritus professor at NIAS, and honorary distinguished advisor, ISRO. Dr. Kasturi Rangan won the Satish Dhawan Chair of Engineering Eminence instituted by INAE 2015-17. His other important positions occupied are in the board chairman of the Board of Governors, Indian Institute of Technology, Madras 2000 to 2005, chairman of the Council of Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore from 2004 to 2015, president Court of IISC 2015 to 18, Chancellor Jawaharlal Nehru University 2012 to 17, Chairman Council of Raman Research Institute from 2000 to 2016, to name a very few of them. Dr. Kasturi Rangan is a member of international and national science academies, including fellow of all the four major science and engineering academies of India, amongst others, is a member of International Atomic Union, sorry, excuse me, Astronomical Union, Fellow of the Third World Academy of Sciences, Honorary Fellow of the Cardiff University, United Kingdom, Academician of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences Vatican, and also the honorary membership has been awarded to him, a very rare uh, honor by the International Academy of Astronautics. And he was also the Vice President of the International Academy during 2003 to 2005. Some of his awards among many, I will just explain to our viewers, include Brock Medal of International Society of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing, LND Emil Memorial Award of International Astronautical, Astronautical Federation 2004, Lifetime Achievement Award of the Asia Pacific Satellite Communication Council, Singapore, 2005, Theodor Kerman Award by the International Academy of Astro Astronautics 2007, uh, Dr. Shanti Sarup Bhatnagar Award in Engineering in 1981, Bhatt Medal by Indian National Science Academy 2000, Ratindra Puraskar 2002 of Vishwa Bharti, Shanti Niketan, Bhatt Award of the Astronautical Society of India 2003, Lifetime Achievement Award of ISRO in 2008, Vikram Sarabhai Memorial Gold Medal 2009 by Indian Science Congress, the Sikotam Award of 2013 by Vishwabharti Shanti Niketan, Haryom Ashram Prayadit Senior Scientist Award 2016 Physical Research Laboratory. He has been conferred honorary doctorates from 26 universities. He is also recipient of Padma Shri. 1982, Padma Bhushan 1992, and Padma Vibhushan in 2000, and has been awarded Officer of the Lean the Honor 2002 by the President of the French Republic. Sir, it's our great privilege to invite you to deliver today's lecture, which will be on the new education policy and an educationist, because on 25th September 1920, Professor Satish Dhawan was born in Srinagar. Professor Satish Dhawan in, also studied at Caltech and our BTEC toppers are admitted as a master's program at Galset in Caltech. And I am very happy to share with uh, Dr. Kasturi Rangan that out of seven years in three years, the topper of the master MS at Caltech was the student from IIST, including this year, uh, Ms. Garima Agarwal. Sir, I request you to kindly uh, deliver your sixth APJ Kalam lecture. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kadwal, for those little long introduction and also for your kind words. Uh, let me at the outset uh, recognize 
I'm happy to see Dr. B. N. Suresh, who is now the Chancellor of the Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology, a very well-known academic and exceptional profession, professional, and a person who has done so much for ISRO over his lifetime. I'm happy that he is now heading this very important institute, the Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology, as his Chancellor. Thank you, Suresh, to see you here. Dr. Dadwal, who is the director currently, was is no stranger to me over years, and uh, he has been doing exceptional work in agriculture in, in your remote sensing, several areas of remote sensing, initially at the Space Application Center, later on at the National Remote Sensing Agency, and then he had occupied as was introduced in several other important positions. Now I see him as the director of this important institute. I am sure his visionary leadership certainly is going to make a difference uh, to the way this institute will go in the coming years. So thank you, Gadwal, for seeing you here. I am also seeing my long-term colleague, Dr. Y.B. and Krishnamurti. Uh, he's a restless soul, if I want to say that. Uh, he all the want to, want to do something different all the time. I'm happy that he's also taking a lot of interest in the research activities of this institute, besides being a full-time professor, as well as looking after certain aspects of the administration at the registrar. But very nice, he is, he is, as I told you, he, he will always like to do something and all the time. And also to be happy to share whatever he is doing with others. So I do get a periodic update on what he is doing because he takes the interest to tell me what is happening. Exceptionally good uh, set of people who is today heading this institute. There is Dr. Chandrasekhar, who is now the dean, and many other professors whom I saw here. Also the other members of the faculty and importantly, the students who are here today attending this function, and also the staff here, staff, other members of the staff who support this institution. I would like to greet once, once again all of you on this 14th Foundation Day celebrations. I'm also happy to see that as a theme for this 14th Day celebrations, um, the Foundation Day celebration, you have brought in an industry interaction. Uh, I think the currently the show is on a turning point, so far the industrial interface is concerned, right from the using the industry for several of our requirements, uh, both in manufacture, assembly, testing, and things of that kind. Now the ISRO is going in a very big way, a turning point, if, I, if I'm permitted to say, with respect to build systems, support system building, support new commercialization strategies, where ISRO need not come directly into the commercialization, and many other possibilities that opens up. You know, obviously, there is an outrage which is increasing. The industrial base in the country will increase. It will have its influence in other areas of the national endeavor. And most importantly, ISRO can certainly remove some of the repetitive job that it has been doing over years. And in the process, try to concentrate more on new research areas, new developmental areas, new ideas of space systems, and use the engineering and the scientific talents of the organization in a way in which uh, it can set up new directions and benchmarks uh, to the running of the space program in this country. So let me congratulate ISRO, let me congratulate this institute for being a part of it and also recognizing the Abdul Kalam's birthday, uh, with, uh, the Abdul Kalam lecture to introduce this aspect of the industrial interaction by the director. Of course, I'm extremely happy that this institute, I have not visited many times this institute, even though I would have loved to but some, sometime or other, you come to Thirvanandapuram and you get uh, worked up, uh, get engaged with so many, too many other things. But certainly, this is a virtual opportunity to see you. I hope one of these days it will convert itself back into the real situation where I can physically be present at the institution and interact with all of you. That is, a, that is something which uh, we should, I, I look forward very much. I also know its beginnings. It's a very interesting beginning that you had. The ISRO was expanding, there was more and more talent and manpower that was needed, and there was this question of whether we have the enough of them, trained people who could take an interest in this particular area of aeronautics, astronautics, and avionics, and things of that kind. And there was this question of whether we should start our own institution for education, research, and training. And uh, there was considerable discussion on this at different levels, but it was decided that it is good to have an institution of this kind. Uh, to support ISRO's ever-increasing manpower requirement, particularly the professional manpower, the people who can really contribute to the highest level of research and development. So the, here it is a thing, and this, the Dual has rightly mentioned 
nearly 1,000 of students have now uh, coming out of this institute and more is on the annual. So obviously it has served its purpose over the decade. I do remember that when I come, I'm going to talk on the education because that was what was requested by both the Dual and Krishnamurti. But when I remember at the times when we were just in the ISRO in the early phase of the program, we are a lot of them. We have a lot of people who were a part of the uh, Indian educational system. I, I am telling this uh, mainly because of the fact that uh, we, we we had a the, the, we, we had in the 60s and 70s the regular IITs were just starting the ASE was there then there were uh, state universities and premier colleges they were the real source of the good educated manpower that we were getting at that particular point of time but I should say in as a special tribute to them they played a very pioneering role creating ISRO's initial capabilities under the supervision of a few foreign educated seniors. I mentioned this because of the, the type of key personnel of ISRO in those years were all Indian education. You look at Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam himself. He was a fully Indian educated and he did so much for the India space program, uh, sitting in learning in India, practicing in India and working in India. And that was his and te teaching in India in the later part of his days years, he of course made it a point to interact with students, he loved students and he used to go and teach in various places including in office. And then we had students like Professor U.R. Rao, Arvamudan, P.P. Kale, Professor Chitnis, Professor Bowser, many others I can talk about. They were all the first generation leaders of ISRO, but all educated in India. Maybe some of them went to U.S., worked for some time as postdoctoral fellows and so on, but they were all part of the system. But then came in the last five decades, the increasing demands on the trained manpower, the increasing manpower, expert manpower. The ISRO was expanding very fast. It was no longer 300, 400 crores budget. It was going into 800, 900,000 crores. The number of people had to be increased. So obviously the academic system in this country and the kind of demand that ISRO was putting, there was a feeling that there is a gap and this need to be filled. That is the genesis of this particular institution. And in the last five years, five decades or so, if you ask me if there's some kind of a number being added to the ISRO's expertise, expertise strength, certainly we have been uh, able to fulfill the objectives that this institution has set to go at, at achieve. And most importantly, not only that it produced those kind of youngsters who are today one of the key mainstays of the ISRO's space program, but equally importantly, it has been now also supporting the research and development and all the rest of it with respect to this. So I'm extremely happy that it has not only done its basic core responsibility, but over years have also expanded it in other areas, like uh, being a part of a research program, which is very critical so far as the avionics, aeronautics and things are the concern, and also working closely with the uh, foreign institutions like uh, the Caltech and many other kind of institutions, which were part and parcel of an international collaborative framework that the Institute has done. I'm extremely happy to hear from the director that two or three of the uh, youngsters who have gone and worked in Caltech, they topped the list in Caltech. And to top in Caltech, you know, the institution which produces every three years a Nobel Prize, that kind of an institution, if you top, there is something in it. And that is where I really feel thrilled to note the kind of performance that this institution has been uh, uh, displaying uh, over the years. So uh, that is at this particular point, what I would like to say is that I would like to, uh, to concentrate a little bit on the educational part of it. Abdul Kalam himself was a teacher besides being so many other responsibilities. He was a good teacher. Then also as uh, Dr. Dadwal mentioned, there is the 100th uh, birth anniversary of the second chairman of ISRO, Dr. Sadish Dhawan, which is around. And therefore, I thought I will say something about him. But equally importantly, he was also a great teacher. He was a teacher of the Institute of Science. He was the director of the Institute of Science. Today, some of the way in which the Institute of Science is functioning, just like ISRO, uh, have owes much to his ideas as his original contribution. So, Professor Sadish Dhawan is good to remember him, not only as the second chairman of ISRO, but also as a teacher and also a person who is deeply interested in the educational system 
of this country. Uh, in the broader context, I want to say uh, the, the, what the country has been experiencing has been a kind of a demand on the educational system, which is very much different from the type of education that was set forth in the last uh, educational policy, 1986, 1992 kind of a thing. So more than 30 years since the last policy came into a picture, that was driving the India's educational system so far. Now, if you look at the country at this particular thing, there is, of course, on one side, the country is putting increasing demands and new demands for development and equitable and just society. Providing universal access to quality education is one of the major goals of the education today. Goal to attain global stage leadership in terms of economic growth, social justice and equality, scientific advancement, national integration and cultural preservation. So you can look at the broad canvas that need to be brought into a picture with respect to the educational aspects of this country, the planning of the educational aspects. And that is one which we really went into the detail in formulating the new policy of education, what you call as the National Education Policy 2020. Now, what is the kind of a thing? And uh, one, one, one of the things is I was also asked to restrict myself to the higher education. You are all inter interested in the higher education part of it. This institute itself is the higher education. But I would like to say a few words about the school education in the policy. The reason why I want to touch upon the school education is because of the fact that a lot of, kind of the, it, this policy is an end-to-end -end policy. You have a connectivity. And there is, even though you may have the flexibility to move out, move in and things like that in the education, right from the school days, right up to the doctorate or even beyond, uh, the question is that if there is enough amount of care to be taken in ensuring that this is a well-connected system of an end-to-end -end type. So what happens in the school, how we organize our education in school has a lot of implication with respect to the higher education. So what we have done is to go into the details of the school education. I won't go into the details of the school education, except for the fact that currently we had a 10 plus 2 kind of a school education. We have now converted that into five years of foundational uh, 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 schooling, then three years of primary schooling, three years of uh, middle schooling, and finally four years of uh, the secondary schooling. The reason why we have gone for this kind of an 18 year, eight, up to 18 years and 15 year of schooling, and the schooling starts at three years and not at six years. So the foundational part of it, the first three years will be starting at three years, and then it goes to 18 years over a 15 year period. The reason why we have to do this is today compared to what it was 30 years back, today we understand much better the neural sciences the brain growth and development, the cognitive sciences and things of that kind. If you now try to map the de development of the brain and try to see how the brain really evolves in the early phase, they are phenomenal in terms of the growth. By the age of eight, the child's brain has already grown almost 83-84%. So this is the period in which we need to pay enough attention to make sure that the early part of the education, the corresponding ability of the child to learn many things and the enormous pot potential that it provides itself in the context of the you, or how you make the child learn mm -hmm. is something which we have gone into the detail, which has not been there as a part of the early school education. So that is why we have to structure it in a way in which it is developmentally appropriate. The child initially, even in the five years, the brain doesn't grow with the linear fashion. It's a non-linear. There is specific growth pattern for each of the child. So you need to really look at it. A child which is very good in mathematics doesn't mean that the child is going to be good in English or language. So there are such kind of differences between the different children in the first five years. So one has to look at that part of it. So by the age of eight, we need to resolve all these questions so that most of the children are put at the same level so far as their ability to learn more is concerned. So whether it is language, or whether it is mathematics, but you may call it a numeracy and literacy. This is something which we have very carefully looked at in the early part of the education, child's education, what we call it the early childhood care and education, ECCE. And then, of course, we go into the middle school education, the, the primary and middle school education, 
where you try to learn from uh, percep perception studies to conceptual studies to prescriptive studies and ultimately abstraction. So you need the different ways in which the child learns this. This is all part and parcel of in ensuring that the different layers or the different stages or phases of the schooling education is consistent with the growth of the brain, the ability for the child to learn. And then we create a lot of flexibility in this too. By the time you, the child arrives at the secondary school, you have a very large bouquet of things where he can study from. There is a flexibility. There is a multidisciplinarity. There is also the ability to learn certain vocational things, which is normally not the case in the school education so far. And then if you want to live at the age of 18, after a school education, you have ample opportunity simply because you have been trained in certain areas, particularly in areas, a certain aspect of professional education, as well as in certain aspects of vocational education, the ability to learn and give in terms of a service uh, support. So that is the kind of a school education that we have envisaged. The most important thing is this prepares the child on one side to get into a profession or a vocation. On the other side, it also prepares the child for a higher education. So at this particular point, I graduated in the higher education. What does higher education mean? If you look at the current higher education, and if you look at what kind of things, if you want to write a policy on this, we should recognize that India is aspiring to become a knowledge economy, would make more and more young Indians to seek higher education. This is already very much evident today in the education landscape. The 21st century calls for quality in university, college education for developing good, well-rounded, and creative individuals. If you look at these words, good, well-rounded, and creative individual. That is what is expected from the 21st century education at the university level. Higher education must enable an individual to study one or more specialized areas of interest at a deeper level, but at the same time build character, ethical and constitutional values, intellectual curiosity, scientific temper, creativity, and spirit of service. So you can see when you talk of a well-rounded individual, a creative individual, these are some of the characteristics that one has to keep it in mind. The 21st century knowledge encompasses a range of disciplines that include science, social science, arts, humanities, languages, as well as professional, technical, and vocational crafts. So that is what you call as a comprehensive educational strategy, a holistic educational strategy. So you have to make sure that it does encompass these kind of subjects and themes uh, that I just now mentioned. Now, it is in this connection, the policy has looked at the education, not as sign silos. Uh, you don't study physics and then neglect chemistry. You don't study chemistry and neglect biology or mathematics. You don't study biology and don't worry about physics. There are many such things which create gaps in the education at the end. So what the policy is, is an education which is liberal, I will say more about the liberal education, what it means at the undergraduate level, to create more imagination and creativity in the student, to ensure their holistic key. The, remember, the key element to the whole thing is to provide a holistic development at the part of the education. And then how do you ensure that through a creation of an ability for imagination and creativity? So the, the undergraduate education really addresses this aspect of it. The concept of holistic education in the Indian context. I want to go back, uh, millennia back. He uh, said, in, is something which is not new to the Indian system of education. If you look at the concept involving mastering of 64 kalas, you know, this is a part of the famous book by Banabata on Kadambari. And what he says is, if somebody who is called truly educated is the one who has really mastered 64 kalas. What does the 64 kalas here mean? It is encompasses music, dance, painting, sculpture, languages, and literature, in addition to subjects such as science, engineering, and mathematics, as well as vocational subjects such as carpentry, with the key to recognize. That is the one that makes the person to be recognized as a truly educated person. So you can see the, the very many areas which you call as a kalas, you have to master those colors to become really a truly education. This was a concept 1400 years back and based on a book, which is so fundamental and seminal, the Kadambari uh, by Barnabata. The liberal education, what, what does this mean? This is liberal education. Liberal education explores the remarkable, just kindly see this. It explores the remarkable relationships 
that exists between sciences and humanities, mathematics and art, medicine and physics, and more generally, the surprising unity of all human endeavor. So it is, there's a tremendous unity among the, the different areas of human endeavor and inquiry. And that is exactly what you call as a liberal education. So if we don't recognize that there is a remarkable uh, relationship, uh, then you are not studying the totality of what the knowledge should be at a particular part of the education. That's where we bring in the concept of an individual education, a holistic education, an education which is multidisciplinary. A comprehensive liberal education therefore develops all capacities of the humans, intellectual, aesthetics, social, physical, emotional, moral in an integrated manner. So the question is, if you attain a certain level of a learned position, a learned, called, called learned person, he should have a comprehensive knowledge of many subjects. He should be able to see the relationship between the multiplicity of knowledges. And these relationships enables you to perform far better in whatever subjects he chooses. Finally, you may call it a major and you may call it as a minor, but it all comes into picture because you see the relationship between the multiple themes because there is a remarkable relationship uh, between the multiple themes of a knowledge base, uh, which is what we seek to realize at the undergraduate education. So what does a more developed education, holistic education mean? So what we have recommended as a crucial step to lead India into the 21st century and the fourth industrial revolution, multidisciplinary education is central. Even engineering schools like IITs will move towards a more holistic, multidisciplinary education with more arts and humanities, while arts and humanities students will aim to learn more science, while all will make an effort to incorporate more vocational subjects and soft skills, India's rich legacy in the arts as well as in sciences and beyond will significantly help in making the move towards such an education and easy and natural transition. So this is what we are really aiming for, for the holistic education with a focus on the undergraduate level in this. Now, what does this undergraduate level mean? So what we are trying to see is it will have an imaginative and flexible curriculum, the holistic and multidisciplinary education. You call it as a liberal education. You can create your create creative combinations of disciplines of study, which is related to each other with certain level of connectivity. Multiple exit and entry points. You are you don't stop your education just because for some personal reason you want to exit from the education for some time. So there is a provision for multiple exit and entry points. Masters and doctoral education will provide research-based specialization. The three to four year undergraduate education degree with multiple exit options, uh, four year program, bachelor of liberal arts, education in chosen major or minor. This will be the four year broad thing. Here you experience the full impact of a multidisciplinary and a holistic education. But the, at the in consistent with the present system of a three year program, there will be a bachelor's program, but the foundational part of the bachelor's program also will have liberal arts education. Both three and four year program lead to a degree. If you have a research as a part of the last five, last fourth year, there are even suggestions that it could be even earlier. You have a master's at the, the fourth year of the bachelor's, you call it bachelor's. And it also, it provides exit. The first year, if you exit, there are enough provisions in the, 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 the uh, uh, curriculum and pedagogy to for you to take up certain type of provision, whether it is in vocation, whether it is in provision. And at the end of one year, you get a certificate. If you go at the end of say, second year, you get a diploma. The third year, you get a degree. And fourth year, if you go with the research, you get a degree with honors. So that is the kind of a thing that we are thinking and recommended. And it has been now accepted by the government and the recent uh, acceptance of the overall policy uh, by the cabinet. The flexible master's program, two years for those with three year, one year with four year undergraduate degree and five year integrated program are the other aspects of the higher education in the context of the holistic education. Now I move into, I'm only touching on some of the key elements which would be of interest to the IAST and therefore I'm not covering the entire gamut of things. The next one I would like to say something about is on catalyzing quality academic research in our fields. I know research is no alien thing for you people, 
you have been now having a very vibrant research program in your institute. But I want to say a few things about why the country now needs to step up the educational, the, the research part of the education, uh, simply because of the fact there are many things that is to be done in this country. Adman Bar, the Honorable Prime Minister, Prime Minister's interest in creating new innovations, new ideas, and the kind of things that uh, the, the, the people want to, there are, there are many youngsters who want to have startups. So in all this kind of a thing, you need ideas, you need seminal ideas, ideas which can produce a good innovation, innovation which can produce products and services and things of that kind. So research and innovation leading to knowledge creation is central to growing and sustaining a large and vibrant economy and uplifting the society. And as you know, we are moving towards a five trillion economy and in next in a few years after that, we can become a three trillion, ten you talk about ten trillion, you actually become the third largest economy in the world. A robust ecosystem of research is today more relevant than ever in the context of climate change, population dynamics, biotechnology, expanding digital marketplace, the rise of machine earning and artificial intelligence. There are many things. I'm many of this, you are also very familiar with you in your own uh, institute. Yeah, but the importance of the research, if you were to ask me, just to give you an example, the European Union estimated the two thirds of the economic growth of Europe during 95 to 2007 was from research and innovation. If you look at the research and innovation, it accounted for 15% of all productivity gains between 2000 and 2013 in Europe, European Union. And that an annual increase of 0.2% of GDP in R&D investment would result in an annual increase of 1.1% in GDP, a five-fold return. So you can see the impact of investments in research and innovation, which can make a substantial multiplier effect in the overall growth of the economic growth, the GDP part of it, five times in this particular example. India's present R&D investment, if you really look at it, if you look at the numbers like 2014, that year, is just 0.7%. If you, if you really look at it with respect to the corresponding figures in U.S. Uh, for another 2.4 or 2.5 percent, you are talking about 4.3 percent in Israel or 4.2 percent in South Korea. All of them are at least three times the proportion of the GDP so far as the research inputs are concerned. Compare it with India, it is only 0.7 percent. So what happens? Low level of investment, number of researchers in this for lack of population is only 15. You should read with respect to a lack of population in US is 423, whereas more than 800 is the number in Israel uh, with respect to the population. The other attendant impacts, of course, we have a low level of patent application and scientific publication. So these are the other aspects of it. The whole idea of the new National Research Foundation, therefore, is to create institutions uh, in, in the, particularly the university system, there are something like 900 universities in this country. Most of them are bare of the you know, research culture. So we need to bring that. So the policy has a strong emphasis on catalyzing and energizing research and innovation across the country in all academic disciplines with particular focus on state universities and colleges. So what are we trying to recommend? A fund to seed research in all universities and colleges so that synergies between research and quality education can be leveraged maximally. So this is an extremely important thing. We have certainly good research programs. 10% of the research is pure. You call it the poor research. Here, see, we seem to be doing well. But pure research is not the only story. So far as research is concerned, we have to go to the applied research. From the applied research, we need to go to translational research. From translational research, we go into industrial interfaces and other interfaces where you really see the impact of the translation in terms of products and services. So these are the kind of thing in which we need to close the entire loop with respect to starting with pure research and creating a lot of knowledge base to industrial or other kinds of requirements, uh, which is the fourth step in an overall research chain. You know, so that is where we are trying to create a fund Enerable fund research across all disciplines, you know, so far, and it will do it with a fund research in innovation universities and colleges. That is the most important aspect. We have I recommended science, technology, social sciences, arts, and humanities, and there will be provision for more like agriculture and things of that kind. The scope of work will include funding of research through competitive peer review. This has to be there. You need to compete in getting to the best of your research fund and carrying out the first front ranking research building research capacity at academic institution across the country. This needs to be done. We need to create mentorship 
we need to make sure that even people who are today available who have retired but who are still available who are very active in this kind of activity they should be brought in to provide mentorship creating beneficial languages researchers government and industry i told about the pure research applied research um, translation research and research towards industry and other applications then disseminating research through seminars and uh, these are the typical thing so this is what we are thinking we are already recommending that we start with the provision from the government of 20000 crores and then start uh, this program across many universities and slowly build up the research strength of this country in the coming years another important thing that our recommendation the zone of policy and visages is ultimately the policy has to take a holistic approach in the preparation of professionals so professionals here means engineers it could be agriculturalists it could be legal people and it could be medical people medical doctors and so on so we mean this is the professional education by ensuring broad based competence so what is the education should encompass it should have an ensuring a have broad based competencies understanding of the social human context a strong ethical compass and addition to the highest quality professional capacities so you need to really bring in this aspect of the professional education and put it along with the mainstream education or vice versa so you don't then at that particular point in the next 10 to 15 years you deal with you don't deal with medical colleges legal institutions um, agricultural sciences you need to integrate them into the mainstream separate review committee we need to really look into this but first steps are being taken by many of the educational institution like iits and so on indian institute of science is looking at it and so on but ultimately what the whole objective is all institution offering either professional or general education must organically evolve into multidisciplinary institution offering both in by 2030 you 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 should be familiar with this you look at what caltech does you look at what stanford does what does mit does we have exceptional breadth in terms of teams where you the child the youngster can navigate through and then have that kind of an advantage in time to pick up what the youngster thinks is useful for provide provide pushing his own profession in the most effective way so that is the kind of a thing that we are thinking we need to increase the number of institution that will be of this type in fact we are trying recommended that will that be three levels of thing research universities research with uh, teaching capability the teaching universities with research capability and autonomous degree giving colleges so three classes of institution is what we are recommending in this connection i'd like to conclude with the part on the higher education by saying a few things about the governance and regulation we want to make sure that the policy has an effective enabling and responsive regulation to encourage excellence and public spiritedness in education and the regulatory system you know you deal with g today what you may call as university grants commission or you look at the national accreditation council and things of that kind the regulatory system what we what the policy now envisages is to ensure that the four distinct function of the higher education in the federal field of regulation there is regulation national higher education research com com committee the accreditation national accreditation council funding higher education the 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 grants council and academic standard setting this is for defining the graduate attributes will be performed by four distinct independent and powered empowered bodies it is expected to create checks and balances in the system you know there is too much of cost engages between these institutions currently so you to put checks and balances and the minimize conflicts of interest and eliminate concentration of power the four institutional structure that i just mentioned will work independently yet at the same time work in synergy towards common goals these four structures will be set up as four independent verticals within one umbrella institution then the government will set this up higher education commission of india so the entire system of governance and regulation will be foreseen and under these four verticals but with the apex body what you call as higher education commission of india with the government will set it up under this uh, policy now i will just give a little bit about the technology part of it because i think the technology has not only come because of the covid times but technology was slowly catching up into the education the use of technology in education falls into broad category at the present juncture primarily improving teaching 
learning and evaluation, supporting teacher preparation and continuous teacher professional development, enhancing educational access to disadvantaged groups, and streamlining education planning and this thing. And teacher training is one important thing. Now, how does educational technology can improve the education system's resilience? For example, I'm giving the COVID-19 part of it. If you look at the teaching and, and, and so on, there are the online education in synchronous mode. There's a synchronous mode of education, which is blended, blended education, blended, blended learning, and then feedback with automated, uh, the smart evaluation. That is the other part of it. And then supporting teacher education, recommender system for continuous uh, growth and certifications. Then enhancing educational access to disadvantaged group that consists of a few specialized teachers for a class, a virtual classrooms for specific needs. Uh, it could be disadvantaged in the contra physical and other kinds of things. Uh, streamlining education, planning education, and so on. Here we somebody recommend a national repository of educational data to track progress in achieving educational goals. So this there is a very specific recommend set of recommendations which deals with the educational policy. One of the key elements in this is the National Educational Technology Forum. What we have recommended and the country, obviously this policy is now in, uh, accepted, uh, will be a National Educational Technology Forum, which will be set up with the following rules to provide independent evidence-based advice to central and state government on adoption, or adoption of policy-based intervention, to build intellectual and institutional capabilities in educational technology, to envision strategic thrust areas in technology domain and to promote education in them among educational institutions and to articulate new directions for research and innovation, the use of technology for improving educational outcomes. Thus, NETF will maintain a regular inflow of authentic data from multiple sources, including educational technology innovators and practitioners, particularly at the grassroots level. This is a very useful deliberative forum. We recommend many institutions to set up technology capability, both in terms of working with the aims of the education in ETF, but at the same time also to carry out research in educational technology, to analyze the ongoing new areas which are coming up in the area of technology. And we cannot slide, we cannot overlook the fact that we are in for many disruptive uh, the technologies that are come to, going to come into the educational field. You can see some of the ones 1986 to 1992, if you look at those policy, they're not at the time, the internet disruption had not occurred in the way in which it is today happening. This policy fully expects that the educational system to face many technological, whether it is artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, big data analytics, and many such things that will happen, which will influence the educational system in a disruptive way. Two major aspects related to such a disruptive technology. One is harnessing technology to improve educational outcome. Examples the human plus artificial hybrid interactive learning systems. The other part of it is the education in new and disruptive technologies, identifying them and preparing students in large numbers. So this is the other aspect of the technology. I will, at this particular point, won't go further into the details of the higher education system. These are some of the elements to give you a flavor of the kind of changes that we are envisaging with the new education policy. The cabinet itself considered this. I should say that this went through several, even after we submitted the draft policy, it went through several reviews. Most important thing is we put it in the public domain. We got more than two and a half lakhs of responses to the public domain. Analysis of all those were a product of the final version of the policy. The cabinet approved it on 29th of this. I also want to say the government is very serious about pursuing it. The number of meetings that the Honorable Prime Minister himself has addressed in the recent past, whether it is as along with the president, or himself, whether it is a part of the vice chancellor's meeting, whether it is part of the governor's meeting, whether it is a part of the visitor's meeting, and whether it is a part of the school teacher's meeting, there has been an enormous number of outreaches that have been made at the highest level, at the level of prime minister, at the level of high, um, the honorable minister of education, and that many of us were a part and parcel of this um, educational policy. So there is a fast movement. The translation of this into the ground realities is presently in progress. The first levels of what will be done next year, next year, and next year. Already there is a timetable which have been worked on both the higher education secretaries group as well as by the school education secretaries. And uh, this certainly will be in, in, in discussed with the state government. Ultimately, this education is a 
concerned subject. So we need to have the agreement with the like state government. There are certain elements the state central government will do, certain things the state government, but there will be a synergy between the two. So this is currently in progress. Uh, but on the whole, there's a tremendous hope that this will move forward, make India a really a trend, now knowledge hub in the 21st century. And many of the expectations that many youngsters have, many of you are here, uh, students now, but with a learning, which will be a lifelong process, uh, you will certainly benefit with many of the suggestions that we have tried to make in this policy, subsequently adopted by the government. And I'm sure that this will be, we, we very much hope that uh, this could be a key element ultimately for the fulfilling the dreams of being an India, uh, which is a knowledge, a economic and knowledge driven society uh, of the future of the 21st century. Now, I spent a few minutes at this particular point to one of the person who would have actually given us a lot of inputs if he was alive, but who knew these kind of things are to be done in this country, a man who always envisaged new things to happen and bringing in the structure of ISRO, the governance of ISRO, these are all an example of what his mind was working as an academic. And I want to say that a good academic, a good scholar, a good person who is very knowledgeable, certainly is the one kind of person who can think in a disruptive fashion. You can think in terms of a very innovative fashion and in a fashion in which the new system, new ideas and new systems can work. And that is the person about whom I would spend a few minutes. That is nobody other than Professor Sadiq Dhawan, who happened to be the second chairman of ISRO. Um, I had the privilege after working with Sarabha in the student, the student career to work in the professional career with Professor Sadiq Dhawan. He had a very unusual uh, academic uh, thing. He had a BA in physics and math, MA in English literature, the B in Punjab University in mechanical engineering, MA in Minnesota in aeronautics and PhD in, uh, from Caltech in aeronautics. Uh, he was a student of Professor Hans Liebman, who was a student of the father of India, American astronautics, uh, the Theodor von Kerman. And he was his, ISRO's chairman from 72 to 84. And I'm happy to see that ISRO is now celebrating the 100th, uh, the, the centenary celebration of his birth uh, only recently. And it's in the final stages, Vikram Sarabhai, uh, birth and uh, centenary was being celebrated. Now it is closely followed by Professor Sadiq Dhawan. And he was a rare confluence. I, Sarabhai was also one, one of the type of person. What I want to say, these two personalities in the coming at the right phase in ISRO and right time being available in this country to lead this program, I think has made all the difference to the ISRO's program. Now each gave his own ideas and visions and each made sure that it is in synergy with the next one. So they gave their own ideas, they gave their own directions, but they were in two different phases of ISRO and they gave it in a way in which they were in synergy and that strengthened the overall system. And it was in such an incredible strength that they gave to the institutional structure of ISRO and that way ISRO will operate that it has withstood the test of time 50 years later with great uh, confidence. I can say that uh, these are by and large the ones that guided us in trying to make sure that ISRO is a sustainable act. The space is a sustainable activity in this country, feeding to the social causes, strategic, technological, educational, mental health, and whatever you want to say. So that is the kind of a person. So Sadis Dhawan was a teacher. He was the director of the Institute of Science for a long, long time. I should say he transformed the Indian Institute of Science in terms of the number of teachers, the departments. People like Sienna Rao were caught from IIT Kanpur and asked to start the, the work on solid state structural, structural chemistry at the institute, thanks to his. And he brought a lot of youngsters to teach in institute, high quality evaluation and things like that. He was a research scientist. The one balance is still considered as a very fundamental in the area of uh, aerodynamics and testing. And he was an engineer and technology, no question. And he was a leader and an advisor. Extraordinary institution builder. And all I can say is any organization he touched, he really transformed it towards a higher performing system. So that was Sadish Dhawan. What did he do for ISRO? He, he, science, he, he, so he started the first program, which you call the Arya Bhatt. Sarabha just passed away once. This was just taking shape. He was the one who really created the entire infrastructure that enabled us with Dr. Rao being in the day-to-day -day loop. An establishment of space infrastructure. 
PSLV configuration, he did quite a lot of work to make sure that it has the right type of capability and the kind of things which can be done in a pragmatic fashion. GSLV study initiation was his. One of the important thing is regarding the cryo propulsion right in 1985, he wanted, he knew that if we have to have an efficient problem, the launcher, we need to have an upper stage which is much better than the, the either the uh, earth storable or those kind of a thing. He knew that liquid oxygen, liquid nitrogen is going to be the way forward when he made the five little investment in trying to make sure that we wet our hands. All I want to say is that wetting the hands in the cryo in 80 as early as 85 made all the difference when we wanted to go for buying this kind of a technology from abroad. Our engineers were very knowledgeable. There were the people from Russia, Soviet Union, or from other countries. They were uh, aghast at the fact that they, we were talking at the same level that they were talking because we have gone through this process of valuation in the early phase of the cryo population work in Israel. Then, of course, there are areas where he started the experimental systems like Baskara and Apple, operational systems like Insert, which he got finally from abroad, four of them. But then he also laid the foundation for putting the engineers, which is today the mainstay of the communication and the broadcasting program. Several applications he initiated, whether it is in remote sensing or in communications or in other areas. Definitions of India's premier satellite series, IRS, was done under his supervision. And then institutional mechanisms like Institutional Space Commission for overseeing the thing, which was, which was the last word in the space. And it, be only, it can only be decided finally beyond this at the level of prime minister. Institutional mechanisms like Inside Coordination Committee or National Natural Resource Management System, Advisory Committee for Space Sciences. These were all his creation. These institutional mechanisms took the test of time for decades. And these are some of the most unique systems that any country set up with regard to the space. And one of the reasons why the Indian system has been so socially oriented, so application oriented, and therefore so relevant with respect to the application which they can provide in the context of socioeconomic development comes because of these kinds of institutional mechanisms that he brought. He had several strategies. I don't want to go into the details of this, uh, but I would like to say he had several strategies which he adopted in running his role. He always, you know, there are there are many examples of India undertaking major scientific and technological programs. You know, technology and engineering will be the key to that. But we seem to be many times working on an end-to-end -end basis. We can get stuck up in some of the things, and then we have a problem of time schedules and budgets and things like that. And sometimes they never see the light of the day. This is something Professor Dhawan really wanted to avoid. And one of the key things he did was that whenever we build a, build a project project report, he wanted to see which are the critical areas. He always asked the question, with these critical areas, if you fail to develop in time, what is your option? And these analysis had to be done, and your configuration should be such that you can, in the last minute, if there is a problem, you can, a buy-build option can be there, you can buy something of the type and fit it into the system. Your system should be able to take it up. Interfaces have to be defined much earlier. So this kind of envisaging expected uh, things which will can hold up a program typically uh, because of a bad planning. These are things which he taught his role how to take care. Similarly, he wanted to make sure that we have a good program with the USA, USSR, European Space Agency. We learned quiet when you talk about ISRO, you USA, buying a satellite itself was a way of knowing a lot of technologies in communication. If you look at USSR, our technology in rockets, cryogenic system, as well as in satellites. There, there were enormous uh, interfaces which had us. European Space Agency is another kind of a support that we got uh, in our opportunity alliances. And then it was even human space flight. It was posed to him that when Rakesh Sharma was to fly, he asked whether ISRO, ISRO will take the responsibility. He found that there were a certain level of uh, uh, the finances that the ISRO was getting. And if you put human space flights into this whole thing, uh, he came to know that this will completely derail the overall rest of the program, which has got the socio-economic impact. And uh, therefore, he felt that this should not come over ISRO with its implications on the manpower, resources, and the core plans of ISRO, how it can get affected, it was very thoughtful. He convinced Madam Gandhi at that time. It was moved to the DRD of the defense group. He said ISRO will provide all the support, but will not take the overall. That's the kind of, he was very bold in taking this kind of decision. Even politically, it was good to have a human space flight for Israel in those years. 
but he knew its implication could be that it can have sometimes harm it could harm certain other aspects of activity which he found was not desirable project management structure something he gave his own ideas they were very criminal ultimately with respect to how to deal with these rose programs and projects even today that is one of the mainstay of isro uh, successful program management strong involvement of industry and academia with the other part of it thoroughness of frame the project reports he wanted to make sure that our project reports are prepared with all the aspects properly addressed whether it is even with respect to the best the nominal and the no uh, this thing of the pessimistic and the all kinds of analysis that to be done he would like to make sure that we have considered many many options before we come to a decision of a particular system and these are things which really became mainstay of our own thinking process in the subsequent years much of what isro does today he is coming out of those kind of ideas that professor davan uh, infused into isro and its youngsters including detailed analysis of options and so on and so forth at this uh, particular point i would like to conclude my talk because i i i talked about sadish davan for two reasons one is he was a teacher i told that the he completely transformed the institute and his teacher also in him as well as a research bent of mind gave him lot of innovative way of looking at issues which included many aspects of isro management isro's leadership and isro's programs and that is another way of looking at it so he did that part of it and in the process also he really imbibed many of these things to many of the youngsters like us i worked with him when i was a member of the aryabhata group later on with baskara and so on but his guidance in things like that even simple things he took it very seriously if we, i was a member a secretary of the board of aryabhata uh, management and i used to make the minutes and after clearance from professor rao who was the project director if you go to him and he used to go line by line and the uh, say i make sure as you know he was an ma in literature also so obviously even english who didn't even bad english did not escape his attention and uh, things like when i when a report is a certain development is taking place in this technology and uh, but uh, things are progressing there are no problems he used to write in the margin no problems i am worried so he would like to see things in the realistic projection so that is the kind of mind that he had i conclude this with that by say from recalling something of my association with this very revered personality uh, in whose name this uh, lecture is uh, instituted uh, dr r p j kalam i don't think i need to bring i need to carry coal to newcastle in trying to talk about joda kalam here so i thought that i should only end it with the next episode when he became the president of india he invited me one day evening to rashtrapati bhavan he said the buddy let us spend some evening i thought he is going to clear the, the, the get lot of other buddies around isro buddies and spend some evening i walked into the, the uh, rashtrapati bhavan at 6 o'clock the time he gave and they went uh, straight to his office he was with me they were instructed to bring me straight to his office he was he then there he said and there was a dining table on the other side so he said buddy come let us uh, let us first take a small walk he said so he took me out into the prashapati bhavan gardens showed some of the things that he himself is taking interest to grow in prashapati bhavan and all that then he said come come buddy now let us have some dinner then i thought that what about your other friends because i thought there were going to be a group and there was nobody only you and me he said so i was really surprised that he was spending an evening with me the first citizen of india with wherever i am maybe the last citizen of india so but anyhow it was that was the first surprise then he told me to sit in the lead table lead his chair i was so embarrassed he said he will sit nearby but he will not sit in the name that is my place i said that you first citizen of india you have to sit i will sit here and i want to talk to you so many things and I'll, but that is all okay i have decided i, I am your host you you have to obey me you sit in this chair this is the chair for you terrific is 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 mine was very different from the way in which people think then we had ordered what was the evening yours dosa adai some kind of uh, um, uh, dal um, uh, the powder those kind of typical south indian and so beautifully made so tastefully done and we spent and with the topped up with a nice cup of coffee the best coffee that you can think of in this country 
and that that took us one hour of chatting and eating and so on and he asked one of his youngsters to come for about 15 minutes and show what he's trying to do in the in that one hour uh, lunch uh, dinner period then he said let us go now then he said, let me show you quickly my library then he took me to the library there was a whole host of books all over a lot of bookshelves a lot of books fill him many books are kept open half half open in several locations in the table and i was so impressed with the kind of things that he follows up in different subjects and his quench he had this so much of thirst for the knowledge and that was very evident when you enter that room then he said let me go to the last room then then we can i can relieve you there was around 8 o'clock he, he took me to his bedroom it was a small i thought it would be a jassi room great uh, this thing and first first citizen of india so that the job is it was a simple room a single cot an ordinary bed and there was nothing in this room which was remarkable there was a radio on one side and a table there was a veena just uh, put in the wall and there was a dhoti that was hung uh, on the not it actually it is that what do you call that uh, the, the, the what is that the, the, the dhoti there, there is that dhoti which typically he needs to wear in trivandrum that was put on a wall hanging that and then his uh, yeah, that was all that room by open room i was absolutely what i may say i mean words failed doing at what what it was paul when i came out i only thought here is the first citizen of this country he can get anything he wants he can think anything and he can get it uh, translated into reality but there was something in him which was so human so down to earth that when he goes back to his room he would like to remember his roots and this bedroom reminded him every night of where the roots he comes from a human being i don't think there is a parallel which i can give as an example i conclude this with that nostalgic memory which i will always remember and these are the kind of things that make the deepest impressions in us whether we can practice it or not is a very difficult question to answer but these are the kind of people that make difference to this country and its value system and ethos so with due reverence to his name and all that he has done for this country i conclude this lecture and thank all of you for this opportunity thank you dr kasturi rangan uh, so i applaud on behalf of all the participants sir generally we have some question answer session also so first i would like to open it for the panelists uh, whether they would like to pose any query to dr rangan uh, sir in the q and a at the uh, software some 22 questions are listed of course some of the participants have put multiple question so one way is either i could pick some of them or you would like to pick No, no, no. You pick up whatever you want. Uh, uh, you ask those guys. I don't want to pick up you. You just do that. Keep the number uh, uh, in a way in which there is enough cross correlation between different questions. So that uh, so sir, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so many people require. Uh, thank you, sir. Happy to see Dr. Narayanan, whom I did not uh, notice at the time. Right. Nice to see you, Narayanan. Thank you, sir. Thank so, uh, shall I open it first for the panelists? Would yes. any of the panelists uh, like to? Uh, put a question directly so i see uh, they would maybe meet you personally and clarify uh, yes, sir i would just explain for 22 questions that you said yes sir i i am going there sir so uh, the one of the earliest question which a student put is what would be the role of regional languages Okay. in the new education policy importance of regional language you know you know the uh, uh, education policy has debated considerably on the uh, policy related to languages the language the policy related to the language is more than what you read or hear in the public as a discussion about language policy the language policy in what you hear is more related to the question of whether the child will learn uh, the three languages if it is three languages will there be a hindi as a part of it or will there be a language 
which will uh, which will unnecessarily load the child with respect to its learning ability. These are the questions that are being asked. I want to say that the three language policy that was set up in the 1986 policy is the one that we have recommended again, but with two differences. One is the fact that those three languages can be any language can be chosen by the school, by the parent, by the child, or by the system there, except that two of those languages should be native to India. That is the number one. Number two, languages were being taught from six years and beyond. Now the language will be started at six, three, to three years itself when you start the schooling. The reason why the, re the language is given this importance right from the age three is I mentioned it to you earlier that by the age of eight, the 1983% to 85% of the brain of the child is already developed. And this is the period in which both the literacy and the numeracy capabilities of the child improves considerably. If you want to make use of the capability of learning languages and put it as an investment for the future, it's better that you start you know, stimulating those areas of the brain which are language specific. And therefore, the earlier you teach languages, the child, then the earlier, the more will be the capability of those areas, the simulating those tissues, if you want to call it, uh, for better ability to learn language. This is, a, this is one part of it. The other part of it is the home language and the mother tongue we have very specifically recommended. Prime recommended up to the age of, uh, up to the standard five, grade five. Because the, it is now scientifically established that since the child learns first the communication, understanding, comprehension, everything happens in, in, in the language which is spoken at home and between the parents. So obviously the mother tongue, the one it is most familiar with, because it starts right from the day it is born in some form or other, not necessarily by speaking, but even by signs, exam, wonder men and things of that kind. So there is a ability for the child which develops right from the beginning. And this ability gets built up over years. And if you build upon this kind of a thing, it has the best comprehension possible for communication in that language in which it has learned right from the day one. And in the process, it has also learned to develop with communication with others, particularly the people at home to start with up to the age of three and later on with people around. So either the home um, mother tongue or a home language is one aspect of it, or the state language, the regional language or the state language, the other kind of thing. These are all neighborhood languages and maximally used by the child to learn the process of communication. And therefore, it is found that these languages, if you learn any ideas or principles like physics or mathematics or other kinds of scientific and other subjects, these are much better comprehended by the child at this phase of the learning of the language. Therefore, it is recommended that we learn mother tongue or the home language as the way to learn even ideas like physics. So we have suggested two languages to learn science, mathematics and so on. On one side, start learning the language by the age of three and then try to have three languages. Three languages, you have your own option, but two of them should be native to India. There is no compulsion of what you learn or what you don't learn and that way only learn three languages. And then ultimately we want to take English as a language because many people think that we, we lose out our advantage if we don't learn English. Please learn English. There's, there is nothing to stop in the policy to stop you from learning English. Uh, sir, uh, participant uh, Siddhi Kadam has written a question. What is something you would advise us that you believe would have helped you when you were in college? Ah, I, I want to say one thing, you know, I, I, I strongly believe in learning, uh, reading. This reading is not related to what I am learning in school or in colleges only. So I, I, we had in those years a lot of time available beyond uh, college, which was not to be spent on training classes, uh, preparation for competitive exams and things like that. So that was an enormous flexibility that I had in terms of, if you are interested in learning, if you are interested in learning history, geography, history, the, um, the anecdotal accounts of civilization, legends, mythology, uh, certain unique ways in which 
mathematics is learned no there are things in this world which i don't have to say i said about the liberal education in some context but these were all available to us because the time was available to us in my period and therefore i used it by buying books and these books are not given in the former shops these books were sold on the footpaths of the matunga where i stayed in bombay and in this footpath they used to put all kinds of used books and they were available in those years the denomination was 4 anas and 16 anas is 1 rupee so 4 anas you could get a book so you buy a lot of these kinds of books whether it is related to roman history by the tacitus of america as we you know the famous annals of imperial rome by tacitus or victor hugo's uh, victor hugo's book or alexander dumas's book they were all like fictions and other kinds of things then there are this question of myths of geese bits of myths and legends of um, the 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 rome and things of that kind there are other kinds of books so you read these and history and so on and you developed a certain level of interest and knowledge and also to some extent feel the human experience of different contexts so that is the one that really help me to understand the linguistic said is the relative the the relative connection between the multiplicity of uh, themes of a knowledge spectrum this grounding came without my knowledge that i am building up that kind of a thing simply because i was interested in reading i had no special love for one area or other i was interested in everything and i read most of it and those 5 6 years to 10 years should be left thing in many things you learn a little better english you learn better history you learn better human beings you know how to better better deal with a particular problem so there were several characteristics of a human being which could be uh, uh, rejuvenated or 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 create uh, create uh, convert it into creativity and originality so i still feel this is very important just looking at a, a google and you try to get a quickly an information but try to do it doesn't complete even today i read books books reading and reading it from a book not necessarily even from kindle or those kind of a thing i read it in a regular hard bound book hold it in the hand and read it probably that is the way i was brought up and i cannot change that habit right now it's too late for me i am just touching 80 this year so i think i continue with it but i think i find it very refreshing and every time you read a book you learn something more the most recent one was how the 100 year plan of china is being translated it's a very interesting book exceptionally good book in terms of research inputs but that is also of a topical interest sir uh, there are a couple of issues about uh, education policy which different people are putting i'll just take the keywords so one relates to uh, the quality of teachers both in the uh, unprivileged area and private institutions second relates to the time it will take for this policy to be implemented third uh, whether it leads to more privatization fourth uh, the entrance to the uh, colleges is through competition which enhances rote learning what will be addressed in various ways these things so can have you, been addressed. can you come one by one so that i can the first one is related to uh, the teachers time time for implementation no, that is the second question so uh, first one uh, related to uh, the uh, quality of teachers uh, yeah. and then the uh, poor uh, yeah geography un unprivileged geography. people as well as in private colleges no research and quality of teachers yeah you know what we have done is we we are aware of the fact that the tei the teacher education institutions had mushroomed thousands of them and they were used to this fly by kind of a, a learning and get a certificate that is something which we are not totally doing away with in the restructured system of educational institution these teachers in education institutions has to either move into A autonomous degree-giving college with multi-disciplinarity capability. Teacher cannot be just taught, taught overnight within 24 or 48 hours. Some some catchy words and say that now you are an expert in curriculum and pedagogy and everything and teaching and so on. That is not what the preparation of a teacher is going to be. So what we have done is shortly we have start recommending 
to create departments of education in major uh, higher education institution. So the teacher's education will be a part of the higher educational institution's responsibility. The reasons are not far to seek. The higher educational institutions have multidisciplinarity and you've got the best of the professors there from various departments and the Department of Education can draw upon the overall resources of a system of university in trying to teach the teachers of tomorrow. This is number one. Number two, the teacher's level will be the BED, which is a four-year program. It is no longer going to be a one year and one and a half years after SSC and that kind of a thing. It will be a regular teacher's program shall be for four years. These four-year BED will be at par with the BTEC of IIT or a LLB of law school or a bachelor of agriculture in the, the agriculture university which essentially means you raise the stature of teachers to the same level as the technology or a professional institution of the highest level that the country has well. they become a part of that they become a part so i if i have a bed i am in a stream i have studied in a stream where a btech has studied from iit that kind of thing because these are going to be multi Institute, multidisciplinary institutions with the liberal kind of education in the undergraduate. This is the second part of it. Second, third, if you have got a three-year degree and you want to become a teacher, within a year you learn the methods of curriculum formulation, pedagogy, communication, and many other attributes that the teacher should have specifically in dealing with the children with regard to their age, the psychology, and how do you deal with them. So that part of the one-year course will qualify yourself with a basic degree of a BSc or a BA or B.Tech into a teacher. That is the third part of it. Fourth, if you've got a B.Tech degree in other subjects, in other areas like science or humanities, and you want to become a teacher, with one year of reorientation, you can become a teacher. So there are four or five ways in which the future teachers would be there. They are all, none of them are comparable to, number of them are anywhere uh, the, the kind of thing that today we have, uh, they are nowhere near the kind of thing that we are recommended as a uh, teacher to this thing. Second, we also want to make sure that we, for the under, under, underprivileged areas or less developed areas, we pick up potential bright youngsters and give them special scholarship and put them into these teacher, higher education institution and grow them as the future teachers who go back to their location or area, under our areas, and take up the teaching as a main job there. So we make the full provision for it by selecting them in the early phase of their school education, give them the appropriate physical, financial, and other kinds of support, put them with the best institutions in the country, in the higher education to become teachers, and then they are brought back into the disadvantaged areas, so where the teaching is concerned. This is the second part of it. The third part of it is the teachers are today not given the kind of attention that we are supposed to give, whether it is in terms of structure, whether in terms of infrastructure, whether the basic amenities, even drinking water and things of the kind, or a teacher's waiting room and the lecture is over, many times in the institution, they don't have a place to go and sit in the teacher's room kind of thing. So these are many other kinds of things we are recommended that all institutions scattering to teaching should have these kind of facilities over the teachers. And lastly, in the case of schools, we have also said, suggested that there be a school complexes. The complexes will have multiple the primary schools, a less number of secondary schools, rather middle schools and one secondary school. This structure of 30 or 40 schools in an area, geography, they are all integrated into an overall education system. The main advantage is you do away with the isolation of teachers, but one of the key, key problems today you, you, you have a teacher, you've got six to 10 students, they teach one subject and they think that that is a full education. That is totally a fallacious way to deal with education. So we have done these complexes. We have recommended models for these complexes, the role of teacher and removing their isolation. They work with their peers in trying to you know, improve their own ability. They communicate with their peers. They have also opportunity for a cadre promotion. So from teachers, you can go to the next levels of uh, administrators, planners, policy makers, and things of that kind. Or, or you can go up to the headmasters and go beyond, headmistresses and beyond. So there are several options are available for teachers to go higher and higher. And there is an evaluation process, which is also fairly rigorous. 
but at the same time very fair in terms of uh, from a promotion in terms of transfer and those kind of a thing which is no uh, very ad hoc there is an ad hocism in transfer so these have been also carefully put in fact prime minister himself made a remark i fully go with the recommendation that arbitrary transfer of teachers should be stopped and so forth. that kind of a thing is made so this is the kind of attention they are getting i think the policy is fairly comprehensive with respect to how the teachers have been dealt with and we think that in the coming years as we try to move towards higher educational institution producing the future teachers the quality of teacher certainly will be very different from what you currently think it does it any other question yeah the... sir one question which some students have pointed out is related to the the competitive examination for entrance iits or even iist which they say uh, promotes rote learning Oh, yeah. uh, does nep has any you know advice on such done away with road running by one means you don't you don't evaluate the student for its ability to remember facts and figures you evaluate the student for his ability to understand ideas principles how much of originality is there how much of creativity is there how much is he able to clearly communicate so these are all what you call as the 21st century skills these skills are the basic characteristics of an evaluation national entrance test net and those kind of bodies that we are setting up will primarily evaluate the student for the 21st century skills of the type that i mentioned so it is no now you cannot just go to a teaching only and get a set of questions on the basis of which you try to write it that is simply not allowed because you were asked a question about a certain principle and you are unable to really explain that principle and this is what happens is most of these kind of kind of youngsters who done this road learning then obviously it doesn't get through the exam that is that's as simple as but at the same time the very fact that the youngster is allowed to now learn in the with understanding of the principles and basics and the ability to under cre be creative and originally you try to create ideas and then you are able to communicate it clearly this characteristic you build it up right from school days you don't build it up overnight so this is much less demanding but if you ask me to what extent rote learning will dealt with there is a component of any evaluation where you will be asked to also remember facts this is more because our faculty many of us we have one characteristic we remember certain details which is also an asset in that so we don't want to leave out that asset by stopping all the things which are memory memorized so some component of the thing will be there as a part of memory but by and large it will be a formative test that that will be carried out and this formative mechanisms of evaluation will make sure that the youngster understands what he has learned it is learn to learn or learn to learn that kind of a thing so that is the kind of a principle on which the whole system will be working uh, thank you sir so when we started there were 22 questions now 35 so i would not get into this unending cycle of putting more questions but i would be definitely sharing all the questions with you and leave it at that sir it was great to have you with us so uh, i would now can request I, the program be taken uh, further yes can, can i can i ask one uh, question sir huh? hello sir uh, sir uh, i i have one uh, concern so what is said is correct so is we have to give maximum emphasis for the primary education and the brain development of student is up to 8 8, eight years age but there is a disparity if you look the uh, the university education and teachers the payment uh, is very high compared to the primary teachers so we should have a mechanism to attract excellent teachers for primary education so how can we make it possible because we need you know montessori type whatever things you explained is very correct but we are not getting good teachers for primary education so could you please elaborate on this how can we do that because uh, that disparity the question of what is going to be the career track of a, a teacher uh, is right from the time when the pre teacher preparation itself you start and the very fact that you assign to a teacher preparation program a level of rigor and a level of stature which is same as those you get in the higher educational institution in professional education or mainstream education yeah. first elevates you to that level 
At that time, you can't have a person coming out of an institution of higher education with a research university or a teaching university to be discriminated. They will simply say, a graduate from this university of this level will have this kind of a grade. It is not going to be based whether he is qualified as a mechanical engineer or as a teacher, B.E.D. It will not be there because you come with similar basis, similar background. You have a foundational thing, which is a liberal education. You have majors and minors, which are your choices. And the, the thing, and there is the credits are only for passing. Credits are not meant for picking up the way pay. The, the pay is fixed because you have attained a certain level of uh, stature stage through your educational system. And that is common to all this. So once you common, make those common, then you can't start making this. Today, the whole problem is you need such a distinction between a teacher education and the rest of the education. A B.Tech from IIT and a teacher education, please tell me where is the comparison today? Unless that comparison is possible and we close that gap, these kind of questions can be raised again and again. So I understand your worry. So that is where we want to close down this gap. Okay, sir. Thank, Thank you, me. sir. We would close the uh, discussion part of the program. Anyone else? Now, our Dean Shaishiki, Dr. A. Chandrasekhar Jeevu, I invite respected Dean Academics, ISD Dr. A. Chandrasekhar, to propose the vote of thanks. Yeah, uh, distinguished uh, speaker of today's uh, the sixth Abdul Kalam, APJ Abdul Kalam lecture, uh, Dr. Kasturi Ramyan. Uh, our beloved Chancellor, Dr. B.M. Suresh, our Director, Dr. V.K. Dadwal, uh, Dr. Narayan, uh, Director, LPSC, uh, Deans of the Institute, faculty members, staff members, dear students and ladies and gentlemen. So it gives me great pleasure uh, in proposing this uh, vote of thanks. We had a very, very distinguished speaker today. Uh, he spoke from uh, his own experience and uh, and it is very, very gratifying that he is so sharp at this age that he actually picked up, uh, I mean, the first question and the second question he could distinguish. Uh, so it was, it was very gratifying, sir. And we are all very thankful for you for having accepted our kind invitation. And, uh, you know, and uh, I mean, we, at the end of the day, we are all enlightened about the new policies, about the care you have taken in ensuring that uh, uh, that this is like, you know, this is for a new India, as you said, this is for a new India, in India where, where uh, we are going to be uh, educated and economy power. Uh, and I, I thank you uh, again. And then I, I, I hope all of the students, all the faculty members got benefited and their doubts and clarifications about uh, our new education policy got completely sort of, uh, I mean, they, they could get their doubts clear. Uh, as director indicated, we had a very large number of question and answer session, but due to constraints of time, we could not go through each one of them. However, I once again thank uh, uh, Dr. Kasur and them, uh, and I hope that uh, as he had indicated that you would be in a position to visit our institute in person and then discuss and talk to all of us and give us uh, the sense of uh, his own, what I should say, his experience and uh, great, uh, what I should say, education and understanding. Thank you very much. Thank you. अपनी मेहनत और समर्पण के बल पर बड़े से बड़े सपनों को साकार करने का एक जीता जागता प्रमाण है डॉक्टर ए पी जब्दुल कलाम भारत को गवर्नित करने वाले महापुरुष को हमारा शर्चत नमन. Once again, thanks to all for attending this lecture. We shall take a break and we'll meet in our afternoon session, IST Industry Meet Opportunities and Challenges. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.